introduce today's speaker, Lawrence Williford. Lance, as he's known, of course, is many things. Uh, first of all, and this is important for me because this is how I first got to know him as a, as a performer, he's a very fine tenor. This is a guy who can never be found at home during Handel's Messiah seasons. He's in very great demand on the recital and oratorio stages all over North America. And then there are his opera performances here in Toronto with Opera Atelier and the Canadian Opera Company, but also in the UK. He's performed Britain's operas uh, at the composer's hometown and festival town of Albrook. So from Monteverdi to Bach to Mozart to Britain and well beyond, as you're about to hear, Lance's repertoire is extensive. And not surprisingly, therefore, he can be heard on Juno Award winning recordings on several different labels. But there's also his contribution to art song or poetry set to music, if you like. And this contribution takes a number of forms. First, as a singer, he's known as a sensitive interpreter of both the music and the words. And every one of those words can be easily understood. He has this matchless diction. And it's in this role that Lance has premiered works by Benjamin Britten, Derek Holman, James Rolfe, Marian Bozetich, and many others. But that's still not all. Lance and his friend, pianist Stephen Philcox, who I'm hoping I think is on today, these two are the co-founders and co-artistic directors of an entity called Canadian Art Song Project. Now this is dedicated to promoting in Canada, promoting and preserving in Canada, the art of song as a vital art form that speaks to performers and audiences both today as in the past. And through their many commissions of new works, their video projects, their many recordings, their editing, their publishing, in fact, of a wealth of song by Canadian composers, they've brought our music history into the present, and they've also enriched the present with new works that have been created specifically for Canadian performers. And even that isn't all Lance has managed to do lately. He's recently completed an MA in media production at, I keep going to say Ryerson, Toronto Metropolitan University. And to be honest, while I'd rather hear him sing anytime, it is actually in this capacity that we've invited him to speak with us today. The COVID years have taken a toll on our groups in the city and around the world, as we all know. And Lens has some ideas about what happened and what we can do about it. So please join me in welcoming Lens Williford to speak to us on Charting a New Path, Classical Vocal Music and Canadian Visual Media Distribution. Over to you, Lens. Thank you, Linda. That means a lot uh, to be introduced to you by, by you. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today, and I hope that you will find a discussion on the performing arts in digital visual media with a specific focus on classical vocal music to be of relevant interest. I feel that it is an important topic for the arts sector as we hopefully begin to emerge from an intense period of instability for artists and arts organizations. I'd like to start off today with a clip from an interview of the poet and dramaturgist, uh, dramatist George Elliot Clark by the actor R.H. Thompson that was produced by Canada's Theatre Museum in 2019. In the clip, Clark briefly talks about the genesis of his libretto for James Rolfe's opera, Beatrice Chansey. This opera was commissioned by Queen of Pudding's Music Theatre and premiered in 1998. It is based on Clark's verse play of the same title and tells of a fictionalized story of black slavery in 19th century Nova Scotia. Beatrice Chansey was, and still is, a significant Canadian operatic work. Oops. Just gonna take a moment and set this up to be where we want it to go. Uh, I, I I did write that uh, libretto and called it Beatrice uh, Chancy, uh, playing off Beatrice Chancy, of course. I took the the basic plot, but I set it in in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia during slavery, and my Beatrice is mixed race. Um, her, her father is her master who's white, her mom is black, who's died. Uh, and she is, her, she is her father's daughter and also his slave simultaneously. 
the the drama begins or the tragedy begins and it is a tragedy it's a five act uh play and and i think it's a five act libretto it is a five act libretto no four act libretto as well uh uh the tragedy unfolds when she falls in love with another slave a black man whose name is at first lead and then it becomes lead uh just the different different pronunciation of the letters of course and and her father uh, flies into a jealous sexually jealous rage uh over lead who he can't stand can't stand the idea of his daughter being with lead uh and so he chains and and brands uh lead and he rapes beatrice uh and and so then uh beatrice goes about organizing his demise uh and at the end all the surviving major characters are hanged uh good Jerry. old british justice <clears throat> So uh, that's that's the opera. It debuted in 1998. Rave reviews made a star out of Misha Ruger Gossman, and and uh, uh, got produced again in 1999 and again in 2001 as a full opera, and has not been seen uh, since. And where was it produced? Uh, it was produced at the at the uh, Citadel Theater in Edmonton. Second time it was also produced at at uh, Eastern Front Theater. Did it. Uh, also in 1999, and it was also filmed by CBC Television and done for Adrian Clarkson Presents. Uh, that's where I saw part of it. That's where I saw part of it. It was the first Canadian opera to be on television in 30 years. There are a couple of interesting takeaways from this conversation, but I would like to focus on just the last 30 seconds of the clip. Note the reaction of Thompson when he realizes how he saw the opera. It was on Adrian Clarkson Presents on CC in 2001. Additionally, note the final statement by Clark. Beatrice Chansey was the first Canadian opera to be on television in 30 years. Now, I know that television doesn't currently exist as it did in 2001. Since that time, however, the only other Canadian composed opera that has been featured on a visual platform of the CBC was Philomena by composer John Astacio and librettist John Morrell. That took place in 2006. I don't know George Eliot Clark or R.H. Thompson, but I sense a sincerity in those last 30 seconds of discussion. There's a recognition that the film's production and broadcast of this artistic work was an event of note and of cultural national significance. Perhaps there was even a sense of pride that the work had been shared across the country on the CBC. Those of us who follow the arts and culture scene in Canada routinely fall into lamentations recalling the way things were. But there are some valid questions that arise from the end of the clip that I just shared. As someone who has made their career as a performing arts uh, in performing arts and classical vocal music and opera, I continually find myself trying to understand how changes in policy or practice over time impact the health of the performing arts sector. For me, one of the most significant questions that arise from this clip is, why has there not been another Canadian opera broadcast on TV in the country since the early 2000s? In 2022, while my performing schedule was sputtering through the pandemic, and I was not sure if my daughter would be attending first grade in person or online at the dining room table, I decided to pursue an MA in media production at Toronto Metropolitan University. I sought to, do, to understand why Canadian performing arts are not being produced for film distribution, TV broadcast, or in the digital media space by anyone in the Canadian creative media sector. My final major research project focused specifically on TV broadcasting and film production in English speaking Canada. My research was largely based on news articles, government studies, and primary source interviews. And I'd like to explore some of the major questions that drove my research and share some of my findings with you now. I will start by reviewing some of the historical background and policy that has shaped the current media environment. I will then give an overview of how some of arts organizations have produced and distributed noteworthy projects in the past couple of years, despite industry challenges. I will end by giving you a taste of some specific projects that currently demonstrate the creative potential for the performing arts to engage in the media ecosystem. The first question I'd like to explore with you 
uh, is has there been a dramatic decrease in the amount of performing arts content in Canadian broadcast media compared to the early 2000s? In short, the answer is yes. And there are a couple big reasons for this. I'm gonna highlight two. Reason one is the changing priorities of the CBC due to funding. According to an international study by Nordicity in 2020, that compared public funding for public service broadcasting the mandate of a national public broadcaster in most Western countries is to support programming in education and cultural arts. Whether on television, radio, or now streaming platforms, the focus of a public broadcaster is to air programming that does not compete with commercial media for advertising or subscription dollars. Instead, the goal is to offer programs that serve the public good, as well as address the interests of underserved audiences. In Canada, however, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Radio Canada, otherwise known as the CBC, exists both in the commercial marketplace while also serving the traditional obligations of a public broadcaster. This duality complicates its mandate. In this slide, I highlight the sections of the 1991 Broadcasting Act that focus specifically on the role of the CBC. While CBC Radio Canada is commissioned by law to exist and provide specific services as described in Section 3 of the Broadcasting Act, as shown here, funding levels are not guaranteed to accomplish the broader tasks concerning arts and culture usually expected of a public broadcaster. The CBC must make up any funding shortfall by competing in the commercial marketplace for large audience ratings and advertising revenue. The business priorities of the CBC fluctuate depending on current media trends and how much non-governmental revenue they must raise. When the Canadian public broadcaster is well funded by the government, priorities in the area of arts, culture and education have historically increased. When less well funded, production costs shift to programming that will attract more significant advertisement revenue. This can be illustrated by the controversial changes in the past 20 years that have allowed the CBC to sell advertising segments on their platforms. As part of my research, I reviewed a listing of programs on CBC television over its history. Between the 1950s and 1980s, arts, culture, and education were a priority in its lineup. As of the late 80s, the only CBC English language adult television program that focused on the performing arts was Adrian Clarkson Presents, which ran for 11 years from 1988 to 1999 until Clarkson was appointed Governor General of Canada. This was followed by the award-winning show Opening Night that ran from 2000 to 2007. Since that time, however, only special presentations and short limited series such as the 2021 four episode show Undisrupted on CBC Gem, the streaming platform for CBC, have aired. No regular scheduled programming has focused on presenting Canadian performing artists on English language CBC since 2007. The second change that contributed to the reduction of performing arts content in the Canadian broadcast media is that Bravo and other cable channels abandoned the arts. The CBC has not historically been the only channel to support Canadian performing arts programming. Indeed, the Broadcasting Act encouraged other broadcasters to cater to interests not adequately provided for by the programming provided for mass audiences. I want to take a moment to point out that the Broadcasting Act has recently been updated and the provisions that encouraged the channel like Bravo to enter the Canadian market has now been adjusted. Uh, on the left side, you'll see the original 1999 uh, aspects of the Broadcasting Act that deal with uh, the broadcasting system and um, uh, how, how to, uh, with the mandates within the broadcasting system to encourage other programs. And on the right side, you'll see how that's just recently been amended um, to include the, the digital space and uh, the online uh, streaming platforms. As you can see with the new amendment, the uh, emphasis for diverse broadcasting has been shifted to the more general term community element instead of quote unquote television programming services. 
The community element includes online and streaming platforms and could include platforms such as YouTube. Between 1995 and 2007, Chum Limited operated the Bravo Specialty Channel with the purpose of focusing on performance and drama across Canada. I'll just point out that the section of the Broadcasting Act that encouraged um, Chum to, to uh, initiate the application for Bravo is the section that has now been changed um, and this is no, lot of, no longer uh, in effect, as it were. In the 1994 CRTC decision, approving the license for the cable channel, the panel highlighted the focus on the arts content as a reason for the supporting the license of the application. The decision on the license application states, the commission is convinced that Bravo will add a significant measure of diversity to the programming choices available to Canadians through its plans for a wide variety of programs having a general focus on the performing arts. Bravo will offer a mix of dance, music, opera, documentary, cinema, visual art, as well as discussion programs from Canada and abroad. The provision of a showcase for such programming will both promote Canadian performers and stimulate the independent production industry in Canada. Another condition of Bravo's license approval was that a minimum of $600,000 per year would be contributed to the foundation to assist Canadian talent in the arts by CHUM. This program became known as Bravo Fact and provided grants for artists and independent producers to create new content. This content was then expected to form a quote, fundamental part of the Bravo schedule. In other words, Bravo broadcast international performing arts content to audiences and used part of their revenue to offer grants that Canadian producers could then access in creating new Canadian performing arts filmed co content. This content was then broadcast on the channel's weekly show called Bravo Fact Presents from 2003 to 2010. To understand the relationship between the arts and the Canadian media environment in the early 2000s, I talked with Liam Romales, director, producer, and founding partner at Riddle Films in Toronto. Riddle Films is an award-winning production company that focuses on performing arts and culture films. He recalled for me the period in which the, his company thrived. Romales credited Bravo and Vision TV, a religious network, and not the CBC for providing he and other independent filmmakers and producers with opportunities to develop performing arts content in film during the 1990s and early 2000s. However, the sale of Bravo to CTV Global Media in 2007, the, spe the specialty channel shifted towards scripted TV drama and away from the performing arts and was then rebranded. Meanwhile, Vision TV was purchased by the former owner of CHUM, Moses Znamir, he integrated the channel into Zoomer Media Limited, a group of media outlets that targeted the baby boomer generation. Vision TV continues to provide faith-based programming, but currently most of the primetime schedule is filled with syndicated shows such as Murder, She Wrote, The Waltons, and Quantum Leap. Let's now explore some of the direct impacts of these changes on the Canadian media landscape. I apologize if this gets a bit dense, um, so please let me know uh, in the questions afterwards if you need a little bit of um, ex explaining uh, in more in-depth explanations about these things. To get a sense of how quickly producers and filmmakers and producers uh, of the performing arts uh, content were impacted by the dramatic shifts that took place, I reviewed a database for video productions receiving tax credits in Canada through the Canadian Audiovisual Certification Office, or CAVCO as it is commonly called. This is an approved Canadian broadcast, um, sorry, this um, CAVCO listing uh, includes any production that receives federal tax credit supports and is broadcast by an approved Canadian broadcaster, such as CTV, CBC, Bell, etc. Indeed, a production needs a guarantee from an approved broadcaster in order to receive CAVCO tax credits. In short, this is how TV programs are made in Canada. Without these supports, Canadian shows are generally not produced. Within the CAVCO database, I could only find two productions connected to classical music in 2008, both of which appeared to be Quebec 
based French language presentations. In my scan through the more general music category database, other than music programming that appears on Znamir's Vision TV, which includes sing-along shows like Time to Sing and your all-time classic hit parade, I found roughly two programs in class classical music each year between 2008 and 2022 that qualified for CAVCO tax credits. These productions always feature Quebec-based ensembles and artists. In contrast, from 1995 to 2007, the programs receiving CAVCO credits included the shows Opera Easy, Opera Stories, and several other episodic concert series, as well as Riddle Films in Performance, the music of Nathaniel Detkerel. Full operatic productions are also included, like the 2006 Canadian opera Philomena by composer John Astacio and librettist John Morel, and Opera Atelier's production of Lulis Per Se. In addition to the concerts, long-form documentaries about Maureen Forrester, and two seasons of the reality show Bathroom Divas, So You Want to Be an Opera Star, highlight the variety within class classical music programming produced during this period. The shift in priorities in 2007 from specialty channels Bravo and Vision TV, as well as the CBC television, resulted in several dramatic impacts that have been and continue to be felt by the performing arts sector in Canada. Since 2008 and prior to the pandemic of 2020, very few broadcast television or film productions of Canadian performing arts content have taken place. This can be attributed to a host of factors as the funding mechanisms along with the production and distribution infrastructure that made these products feasible prior to 2008, no longer exist. The Bravo Fact program that I mentioned earlier was shut down entirely in 2017 after the CRTC removed the condition of license requiring Bravo to financially contribute to the program. According to Ramales at Riddle Films, without interest from a private channel such as Bravo or the support from the CBC, Producing professional caliber performing arts content for film and television has been, and largely still is, considered prohibitively expensive. There is currently no CAVCO approved broadcaster that is committed to regularly producing performing arts filmed content for broadcast in Canada. It's worth noting that during the period that Bravo, Vision TV, and the CBC were actively engaging with and supporting the creation of performing arts programming in TV and film, attendance in cultural activities, including the performing arts, increased from a then low point in 1998 of 37.6% of the population over 15 years of age to 41.2% in 2005. That was the only bump that I ever saw, uh, an upward bump that I ever saw in those statistics. It's now gone significantly lower. The second question I would like to explore with you is why isn't the CBC doing more to produce and distribute work funded through the Canadian Council for the Arts and other federally funded granting systems connected to the Ministry of Canadian Heritage? I must admit that I still do not have a satisfying answer to this question. I applaud the Ministry of Canadian Heritage supports that encourage the performing arts to explore digital and filmed content creation through federal granting programs to artists and arts organizations. However, doing this when no viable distribution mechanism exists to bring the content to audiences is problematic. Nor do I understand why the public broadcaster is not currently part of a production pipeline to bring Ministry of Canadian Heritage funded projects to the public. To me, it seems like a lack of coordination and a waste of public funds. In previous generations, the intersection of the performing arts sector and the media sector was clearly defined. While I recognize that more artistic voices are now part of the broad Canadian arts and entertainment sectors, there seemed to be an understanding of how one part of the government effectively connected to the other. In the past, the Ministry of Canadian Heritage assisted performing arts through the arts councils, which helped promising artists develop their skills, their expertise through years of study and performance. If and when a media sector producer, often the CBC, but not always as demonstrated earlier, undertook a project focused on the performing arts, they would film or record this project in collaboration with a distributor or with the promise from a broadcaster that the work would reach an audience. 
This is what happened in 20, or, sorry, excuse me, this is what happened in 2001 with Beatrice Chansey. Rolf and Clark were funded through grants obtained in collaboration with Queen of Pudding's Opera Theatre. This small opera company, funded through public grants and donor support, brought the new work to the stage. Queen of Puddings employed professional stage performers, crew members, and musicians who excelled at their craft, and they presented the work to live audiences. A completely different media producer, in this case the CBC, then captured the performance for a visual filmed medium and distributed it through a national broadcast. In this situation, artists were initially paid performance fees from Queen of Puddings for their work with the company in front of a live audience. In addition, the performing artists on stage, all of the musicians in the pit, and the composer and librettist were also paid a separate fee by the media producer for the work to be broadcast during a specific time period. The artists involved received two separate fees from two, separate, two different organizations under completely two different collective agreements, one for the stage and one for the screen. This no longer happens when it comes to the performing arts in Canada, even though all of the mechanisms, union agreements, and licensing fees are still set up with this model in mind. In most cases, the, the artists or an arts organization, uh, for, an art, for an artist or an arts organization to create a work to be filmed and distributed, the creators within the performing arts sector are now responsible for funding all aspects of a media project. Unlike what happened in 2001 with Beatrice Chansey, when artists and arts organizations could rely on media production partner or a filmed producer or film producer to distribute a project through television or cinema, there is no current viable distributor or broadcaster in English Canada actively seeking to collaborate on such projects. I've used the example of Bicycle Opera Project's uh, filmed production of Juliet Palmer, Anna Chatterton's opera Sweat as a comparison to the Beatrice Chansey model. Note that the filmed production of Sweat is still seeking a way to be distributed. I have been told by Bicycle Opera that they hope to release their film on CBC's streaming platform Gem. But to my knowledge, there is no current agreement in place. The CBC or Bicycle Opera project would still be liable for the costs associated with the broadcast and distribution. And there's been no agreement on that as I, uh, from my understanding. To be fair, the CBC has demonstrated some interest in co-producing uh, co new visual media performing arts content when significant funding partners step in to finance the project. But the number of projects that are produced for CBC platforms is tiny compared to its celebrated past. About a year ago, I spoke with Grazina Krupa, the executive in charge of programming at CBC Television. When I asked the, about production projects and the performing arts, she pointed to collaborations with the National Arts Center, the Luminato Festival, Obsidian Theater, and the National Ballet. But she also noted that all of these organizations came to the CBC with significant funding in place. This leaves out the majority of projects and does not elevate some of the projects that deserve a media platform. Without a broadcast agreement or a licensed distribution, there are few, if any, ways of recouping the expenses of producing these kind of projects for, for performing arts organizations. Artists and arts organizations who have successfully made some return on the investment are rare in the current environment. Given that artists and arts organizations are now having to produce and distribute projects without media partners, how are they currently funding activities in the digital visual media space? The divide between the possibility of funding media projects in the performing arts sector versus funding and producing through the media sector became extremely evident during the pandemic. As arts organizations explored producing filmed projects that were larger in scope than any previous projects developed in-house, they found Canadian domestic broadcasting to be inaccessible due to business priorities in the competitive media environment. In addition, ongoing funding supports for film and television, like the Canadian Media Fund and CAVCO tax credits that I mentioned earlier, and so on, are also provided to for-profit companies. The arts sector is almost entirely made up of charity status organizations and are therefore ineligible for media sector supports. As noted earlier, there are various digital media creation grants that have been made accessible uh, through the competitive Digital Now or Explore and Create application process, 
from the Canada Council for the Arts. And other similar um, hybrid production funds are available through some provincial arts councils. However, the money available to create any project is tiny in comparison to the commercial film and television project work, uh, the, the, uh, industry and the projects that they go about. Both Digital Now, which is no longer active, and Explore and Create funding streams through the arts councils might potentially provide between $50,000 to an exceptional $100,000, but these amounts pale in comparison to the commercial film projects that, according to Lee and Romales at Little, uh, Riddle Films, often spend around $400,000 or more an hour of, for content. Such a disparity resulted in the creation of a great deal of Canadian performing arts content during the pandemic era that was of inconsistent aesthetic quality. Indeed, for any performing arts media project to find success in the current media environment, it must be able to compete for an audience against well-funded commercial products. Arguably, those works which have found an audience and provided an impactful experience have been the exception rather than the rule during this time. I would suggest that there have been only a handful of successful Canadian film projects that really stand out among the many classical vocal music productions in the past three years. To my mind, these would include, but are not limited to, Against the Green Theatre's Messiah Complex and their Savitry production, Pacific Opera Victoria's Double Bill uh, featuring Megan Latham of The Italian Lesson, Bon Appetit, and Bicycle Opera's uh, film production of Sweat. I will spend a bit more time on these projects later, but it is important to point out that most of these projects were done on shoestring budgets during a time the artists were just happy to be paid to work. Among these examples, the widest circulation was achieved by distributing their films on an open platform such as YouTube. Some arts organizations distributed by connecting to a ticketed system, which uh, created a paywall in order for uh, customers to watch. However, anecdotal evidence suggests that companies generated more income by asking for donations as opposed to instituting a ticket fee, assuming that the production was of the highest quality and audiences were enthusiastic about the work. Another possible revenue generator for a filmed project is to license the work to another platform or channel. Work of the highest quality can be exported and licensed to a variety of international art streamers like Opera Philadelphia Channel, Stingray, Medici TV, and Marquee TV. These direct to consumer or streaming channels usually pay the producing company a fee for each viewing during a set period of time. The last option that has been somewhat successful in generating income for some organizations has been to distribute the work in small independent cinemas and theaters either as part of a film festival where films don't actually generate income, but might get some sort of positive uh, audience response, or as private rentals where, where the cinema is rented and the producing company receives box office sales. I would suggest, however, that the majority of the performing arts filmed content ends up unmonetized on YouTube. As I mentioned earlier, Clearing rights and union fees have made filming and distribution of many projects quite challenging. So let's briefly look at the impact of rights claims and union agreements on producing filmed performing arts content. <clears throat> Almost every conversation I had with arts organizations and other stakeholders during my research pointed to current union agreements and complications regarding clearing rights as one of the major obstacles to media creation and distribution. For example, the various collective agreements that come into effect when an opera is to be produced for film, television, or radio, and broadcast through the media are extensive. In Canada, singer actors are covered by Canadian Actors Equity Association for stage productions. If a production is then filmed and or recorded for broadcast or distribution, the singer actors are also covered by the Alliance of Canadian Cinema, Television, and Radio Artists, ACTRA or the Union of British Columbia uh, Performers, collective agreements. Instrumentalists are covered by the Canadian Federation of Musicians or Toronto, uh, Toronto Musicians Association. Stage managers and crew members are also covered by the regional branch of the International Alliance 
of theatrical stage employees, or IATSE. Each of these labor unions have agreements in place with the existing arts organizations, like opera companies, ballet companies, and symphony orchestras. In general, the larger the company and the longer that the company has been operating, the greater the financial obligation imposed by union agreement for a production. Certainly, artists must be paid an appropriate performance fee. However, at the moment, media producers are avoiding the pro performing arts due to the significant costs. Based on my understanding of the issues, there are two significant factors at play that undermine media creation and distribution of performing arts content. First, the rights and union related fees for broadcast and distribution are substantive. Second, these fees are usually not recouped by Canadian broadcasters and distributors through revenue. As an example of how these agreements have impinged on the broadcast of Canadian opera productions, we can look to the inability of the Canadian Opera Company to reach an agreement with the Toronto Musicians Association and Equity in 2012 to record and broadcast COC operas for Saturday afternoon at the Opera on CBC Radio. The COC and the unions could not come to terms, and as a result, COC operas have not been broadcast on CBC for over a decade. At the time, the CBC Director of Music Programming, Mark Steinmetz, noted that CBC had previously produced their own opera broadcasts, but they were now moved, uh, moving to partner with opera companies due to budget constraints at the CBC. This was a significant moment in the relationship between media and the performing arts. This, moved, this move by the CBC solidified the shift of the financial burden for the media production from the public broadcaster to the opera company, from the media sector to the arts sector. More recent concerns over the cost of producing classical music visual programming was further contextualized in my conversation with the CBC television executive, Grazina Krupa. She pointed out that the reason why CBC moved away from visual representations and music performance is because the cost, the rights, were so prohibitive. These costs are significant for legacy institutions like the CBC and the COC. Whereas smaller or younger institutions might be able to negotiate with equity or ACTRA on individual projects, larger organizations find this more challenging. In 2012, following the failure to negotiate a new agreement over radio broadcasts on the CBC, then COC Executive Director Alexander Neef released a statement stressing that while the company made no money from the broadcasts themselves, they are, quote, a valuable means of raising awareness about the vitality and relevancy of opera in the 21st century, end quote. He added that, quote, the broadcasts are extremely important for the future of, the, of opera in this country, end quote. In discussing filming and distribution of operatic performances with current CEO, sorry, excuse me, current uh, COC Executive Director Perrin Lynch, Perrin Leach in 2022, he made it clear that coming to an agreement with the various unions was critical to his strategic plans for the visual media space. I have to get more flexibility in our contracts, he said. The people negotiating for the unions all believe they're giving up money because artists used to get paid for that work, but they're not. There's no money in any of this. For the film productions that I examined in 2020 to 2022, the issues around union agreements created more obstacles for some companies than for others. Most companies that uh, pursued projects paid the fees for an, inter for an internet broadcast window of a few months and then moved on. But it is important to note that these kind of fees, as set out in the collective agreements, used to be paid by media broadcasters, whereas these costs are now burdening the arts sector. The CBC and other broadcasters and distributors still show interest in delivering performing arts content, but at this time they expect performing arts producers to pay these fees on top of the artists live performance fees. Even more concerning is, as I noted earlier, with the example of Bicycle Opera Project's opera film of Sweat, that the that when the broadcaster is involved, well, sorry, excuse me, that when no broadcaster is involved, arts organizations must step in as the producer and distributor. The costs associated with the distribution models of the past have now been solely placed on artists and arts organizations. This occurs at a time when the performing arts sector is struggling to retain financial viability. 
Over the last 18 months, there has been a pretty uh, significant loss of appetite from the larger performing arts organizations to pursue filmed media and the digital space. Much of this is because of the complications that have clearly exhibited themselves in the past couple of years. Um, and, however, they also realize that their mandate is truly to pursue the live music experience. So this means that smaller organizations are taking up the mantle. Organizations like Renaissance Opera in BC, Bicycle Opera Project, Opera 5, Against the Grain Theatre, and Canadian Art Song Project in Ontario are all interested in exploring the creation of filmed and digital media. In the coming year, I plan to establish a working group through Canadian Art Song Project with the Association of Opera in Canada and other organizations to explore how changes in policy could help support the intersection of the performing arts and the creative media sectors. So let me, at the end here, let me just uh, highlight some of these companies I've mentioned briefly um, and some of the work that they've been doing. As I believe it kind of shows uh, the, the potential of what companies can do uh, in the media sector. As I mentioned before, Against the Green Theater um, had major success with their Messiah Complex production. This was first aired in December of 2020 uh, during the Christmas season. It kind of came out um, at a period when there was a lack of, of real um, performing arts film content or, or anything that, that could be considered celebratory in any way uh, at, and at a low point. And Against the Green released this project. Um, initially, they did it through registering people to watch for free and they just developed a database of email addresses and then asked people to donate to them. Um, and they've released uh, this film multiple times over the last three years during the holiday seasons of uh, Christmas and Easter. And I think they've just now, this last year, they've stopped uh, um, releasing it in that way. They also explored licensing it to other companies. Uh, this, I'm gonna show you a brief, um, trailer for the Marquee TV licensed uh, uh, release of this film. And it also includes several of the, the media responses to the film when it was first released. So this gives you a sense of, of how uh, Against the Grain was able to use a variety of models for distribution to reach the largest possible audience. I should also men mention that uh, they funded that project largely because they were planning on doing a um, in-person Messiah performance and they diverted all of that in-person Messiah performance for uh, I think 2019 or excuse me 2020 and put that all into filming. Um, so that's where they had their their revenue, their money went uh, to produce just switching from a live performance to a uh, film performance. Um, subsequent projects uh, were funded different ways. Um, and frankly, from what I understand, the money generated from that production actually helped them be able to financially uh, afford trying to explore and create some of the other projects that they did. Um, Savitry, I believe, was completely funded through the revenue that was generated from uh, the first year that that was uh, Messiah Complex was released. So that's kind of they they hit peak success with that production. Another company that I mentioned is Renaissance Opera in um, BC. This is a company that has 
been exploring the intersection of digital media and the performing arts, uh, classical vocal music. Um, they've done so with a kind of immersive interactive digital um, project they've been working on. It's called Orpheus. Uh, and that's been generating a avatar in um, a motion capture avatar in uh, video game engines. And that's the, the picture you see on the left. And they're now moving this into creating a uh, kind of immersive experience in live theater spaces. So um, they're doing some really interesting things in that space. And they also developed a podcast, a basically a kind of narrative story podcast um, during the pandemic. And they just released their second season of this podcast called the Apocrypha Chronicles. This was highly um, successful, an award-winning podcast. And uh, I'd urge you to have a listen. Uh, it's, it's on your, wherever you listen to podcasts, um, you can download this. Um, so they're doing very interesting things. I will say that because they're in BC, they're, I think they have access to different funding for the media from the media um, sector. Um, I think BC seems to be a little bit more open. They're, they're provincial uh, funding mechanisms for exploring the media space, um, unlike Ontario, where it's very, very specific. I've been mentioning the uh, Bicycle Opera Project's uh, film Sweat. Um, this is a production, they, they created a touring production of, of uh, Juliet Palmer and Anna Chatterton's uh, opera in 2017, I believe, and that toured uh, a fair bit in Ontario. I didn't get to see it at that time. I was off someplace working, I think, in England at the, at the time. So I was always a bit disappointed that I never got to see it. Um, during one of the summers, I forget which summer, that there was lockdowns, um, Bicycle Opera was able to quarantine, basically go off to Kingston and created uh, a film production with the same cast. Um, they got money for, I think, I think it was the Digital Now, uh, Canada Council for the Arts program. I think they got about $100,000 for that. And then they got some support from uh, Kingston as well, about $40,000 uh, from Kingston and other private donors to make this 70-minute uh, film of uh, the opera. I got to see it. It's only been released at the Kingston Film, the Kingston film Festival, um, and I got to see it there. I thought it was pretty stunning. Um, they did a terrific job with it. Um, I'm not sure where it's going to be distributed, if it's going to be distributed uh, more widely. Um, I know they're trying to figure things out in that capacity, but it's a it's quite quite impressive work that they did, especially knowing just what the shoestring budget is that they worked on. Um, and I want to show you the trailer for this. Another company that is 
And playing in the uh, filmed digital visual space is Opera 5. Uh, again, during the lockdown period of the pandemic, they put together a uh, basically a children's um, show called Three Penny Submarine. And uh, Opera 5 partnered up with Gazelle Automations, which is a puppet company. Um, and they, again, got money from Canada Council in their Digital Now project uh, funding mechanism uh, to basically put together a pilot of, of this, this show. Um, again, they did it on a shoestring budget. Um, uh, I know that the when I talked to Rachel Krem, the artistic director there um, with Opera 5, she said that basically Gazelle, it's an in-house kind of uh, mom and pop puppet uh organization and they just loved the idea of doing this so they did it you know very very cheaply and did everything themselves basically um my daughter is so there's only one episode right now because they haven't had a fund they haven't been able to, to do it and i believe they just got some more funding from canada council uh, so they're hoping to do seven more episodes to actually get a full first season of this there's no distribution other than YouTube right now for this show. Um, and uh, I think it's quite cute. My daughter loves it and she wants to know what happens. So I'm gonna share just a couple more minutes of this with you. This Lydian? Oh, Iona, just think. Two best friends. The first to explore the mysterious Salieri sector. No one else has ever done it. It's going to put us way off course. Oh, Iona, don't be a chicken. I'm a cocktail. <sighs> oh no, the map! We need that map to know where we are. Why did Central Control put us in charge of the Three Penny Submarine? We haven't gone through proper training. We don't know what we're doing. Uh, I know. It says how to fix the map in the Three Penny Manual. Uh, have you seen the Three Penny Manual? <sighs> Lydian, everywhere you go, you make a mess. How did you manage to mess this place up so quickly? Um... <gasps> Uh, the final example that I want to just share with you is what Canadian Art Song Project, um, the organization that I co-artistic direct with my colleague and friend Stephen Philcox. Um, we put together a series of three presentations of Art Song over the past two years um, in a series called Reaching Out Through Song. We basically used the visual medium through uh, a filmed visual medium to present two brand new um, song cycles and then also uh, 
this set, this short set of songs by um, John Beckwith for his 95th birthday last year, um, we released this uh, short video sequence um, of uh, John's four short songs uh, based on um, which, which set uh, Kandinsky uh, poetry. So these are very, very short and I just wanna play one for you um, to give you a sense of some of the work that we've been doing. It's basically a music video, but um, as I said, we kind of did a whole smattering of very different kind of film projects. Once there was a long table called a long, long table. Right and left at this table sat many, many, many people, 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 people. Oh, a long, long time at this long, long table. Um, and just so you're aware, again, Canadian Arts on Chronic Project, we release those primarily through YouTube, um, and they're just available. So there's there's no distribution model for us other than they're just available for people to go to. Um, so we are not receiving yeah. any revenue for those works. Finally, I just wanted to mention um, a company that a startup company that is trying to address some of these issues that I've I've mentioned briefly. Um, I said that there's no CAVCO approved broadcaster that is committed to regularly producing and broadcasting performing arts filmed content, but there is a small startup company called Stageview TV that is trying to address this. Stageview uh, is building a platform to be both a direct to customer streamer. Uh, exhibiting curated arts content as well as a studio produ uh, producing arts programming using production funding reserved for the film and television industry. So they're a for-profit company, uh, production company, um, and they are basically came up uh, out of the Ball and Rand Entertainment uh, production studio in Stratford. Um, and they hope to provide performing arts organizations the ability to leverage stage views expertise as a producer while earning new revenue and increasing um, market reach. So um, they're in their beta phase right now. They, they're trying to make themselves um, demonstrate to uh, CAVCO and the broadcasting um, entities that they are legitimate and there's content out there, but they're trying to figure out the um, realistic business model to make this work. Thank you, everyone. That's uh, the end of my presentation. I'm sorry it went a little bit long. I hope it wasn't too dense. Um, I know we've got a, a, a question and answer period, but um, even beyond that, feel free to reach out to me with any questions or comments. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Lance. That was wonderful. We're going to take a 10 minute break so people can get coffee and do whatever they need to do after an hour. 